With that, I'm going to kick off the meeting. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Christina Henderson, the Executive Director of the Montana High Tech Business Alliance. And we are pleased today to be partnering with the Montana State University and the College of Engineering, Norm S. Bjornsson College of Engineering um, to host this panel discussion on technology education. Um, very important issue. And we're gonna be covering all aspects today from K-12 education through higher ed, um, engaging our rural communities, veterans, uh, people, uh, diverse people within our state. So um, we're excited for this conversation. We do have um, some key stakeholders that are joining in Zoom. So we're hoping that they can share as part of this meeting as well. Um, to kick things off, we would like to find out who is here in the room. Um, so I'll just have everybody say your name and your job title and affiliation. And maybe I'll begin with our participants in Zoom. Marianne, would you be willing to go first? Sure thing. I'm Marianne Smith and I'm a founder and executive director for Code Girls United. We started in Kalispell and we are all over the state now. And Julie? My name is Julie Heller. And I am representing uh, Fusion Robotics, which is a team, an FTC team um, within the FIRST organization. We are a youth robotics team and um, I'm a board member. So I'm um, just interested in the conversation about technology education. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll start over here, Jack. Would you be willing to go next? Sure, uh, Jack Rumpel. I'm uh, a mentor with First Robotics and um, working with teams across the state. Everyone, I'm the government affairs director here at MSU. Uh, Wes Fikes, director of the State Workforce Innovation Board at the Montana Department of Education. Hi, all. I'm Joe Schmuck. I'm the director of Veterans Affairs at Travis Atkins Veterans Support Center here at Montana. Uh, Trevor Huffmaster, director of the Box Home Launch Pad um, here at Montana State University. Um, and we're focused on entrepreneurship across the ecosystem here. So, thanks. Uh, Garrett Beach, uh, we're getting next frontier capital and early stage uh, VC investment firm state here. Too. I'm Kelly Jordan, I represent Hustle 365, and I'm a teacher. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Pat Flowers, and I represent Senate District 32, which includes uh, campus here and runs west to four corners and then south to west all south. So. I am Mike Alton. I'm with the Office of Public Instruction and I'm the Industrial Technology Education Specialist. Hi, Blake Hitson. I'm a Hiring Our Heroes Fellow at uh, Miltech Energy. <coughs> I'm Jennifer Carlson. I represent House District 69, which is Manhattan, Freeport, Churchill, Northern, and Western Gallatin counties. I'm also Senate District 35, which is Jennifer's House District, and then reaches over to East Helena, all of Broadwater. And then I farm and ranch with my kids if they left me out <laughs> the, on the west side of the Gallatin, which we love. I pet <laughs> Uh, Ken Walsh, uh, representative for House District 71 over Twin Bridges, which takes in Madison County, uh, parts of Jefferson and parts of Silverville. Uh, also a rancher over there, retired banker. My first job was a vocational ag teacher. So I've been involved in technology a little bit. Thank you. I'm Pete Santos. I'm chairman of Mollet, a wireless asset tracking company. I also advise on the board of <coughs> uh, I'm Abby Turner, I'm the Executive Director of the Montana Science Center here at Movement. Um, in our 20th year as a hands-on uh, science teacher for Hi, I'm Beth Barr, I'm the Service Special Assistant to Dean Gunning, and I also uh, have the pleasure of being a lecturer here at Michigan University. Okay. Right. I'm going to do a quick sound check. Mary Ann and Julie, could you hear everybody reasonably well? Yes. Excellent. 
amazing technology. Thank you to the MSU College of Engineering for uh, making the technology work for our Zoom participants today. So for this first session, um, we're going to hear from our expert panelists. Uh, we have Brett Gunnick, Dean of the MSU Normus Bjornsson College of Engineering, John Paxton, uh, the chair of the MSU Gianforte School of Computing, and Stephanie Gray, Dean of Gallatin College, MSU. And so we will, why don't we have Dean Gunnick start off, but if you could each introduce yourself and your school, briefly tell us about your own background and about the school and programs that you lead. Hi, I'm Brett Gunnick. I'm the Dean of Norma at Thornton College of Engineering. I've been in that role for 10 years now. Would you use the mic, please, Brett? I think within the room, it's maybe harder to hear in the back. Thank you. Okay. Go yeah. Okay, so I'm still Brett Guy. I'm still the Edith Norman of Norton College of Engineering and some of us have to change really quickly. Yeah. Um, I've been dean for, for 10 years now, and before that I was a civil engineering department head. And before that I had uh, started my academic career at the University of Missouri, and before that I was a, an Iowa kid. I grew up in Iowa and I had uh, went to Iowa State University of Colorado, so I went to uh, Years of school there. Um, that norm as the Arnson College of Engineering is a uh, full service uh, engineering school. We serve 3,800 uh, students in the College of Engineering. Our enrollments have grown rapidly uh, over the, about the past 15 years, although they've leveled out a little bit over the past two or three years. Uh, we had a big freshman class. Uh, this fall, almost the biggest in the history of the college, the university had its biggest session class. So we'll have to wait till next fall to see if that's a, a COVID anomaly or is a, a pattern of, of that sort. We've tried during uh, the pandemic to do the very best we could in terms of delivering the face-to-face, hands-on um, engineering education that is the hallmark of this university. Uh, Sometimes we were a little weak at that, particularly last year, it was really hard. This year it's got easier, but we keep moving uh, the right direction um, in that regard. We have most engineering programs that one might expect from uh, a broad college of engineering. A couple of our most recently added ones are environmental engineering. Uh, and the very most recent one uh, is uh, biomedical engineering. So if a Montana student wants to go and study engineering, we probably have uh, the engineering program that they're interested in. We'll leave petroleum engineering to tap to have that one. Maybe, maybe not that one. Um, I mentioned Montana kids. Uh, Montana State University and the College of Engineering have um, a large enrollment in uh, out-of-state students. Um, Nominally, in the College of Engineering, um, that's half of the students. I don't know what the exact percentage is, but that's good enough for course of this discussion. Sometimes I get answered or get asked the question is, what about the Montana kids? Right, aren't we here to serve Montana kids? And the answer to that question is absolutely we're here to serve Montana kids. So one of the things that is unique about the College of Engineering in Montana State is we do not have limited enrollments in engineering our secondary case. So one of the reasons we attract a lot of out-of-state kids is because some of the states that they're coming from, Washington, California, Colorado, that is true, right? So if you have a youngster and you live in uh, Seattle and they're aspiring to go to the University of Washington, First, they're going to have to get into the University of Washington, and they may not find out whether they can complete their engineering degree until they're a junior. And so that limits access to engineering in a way that's inconsistent with what Montana State believes is the mission, mission of the public land by the university. And if any of you have said, heard President Cruzado for talk for more than about 30 seconds, you know how important that is to her. So all the Montana kids that want to become engineers can come to Montana State. They have a wider selection of offerings that are available to them. 
um, if, if we were sized only by Montana kids uh, and um, we're a, a size of the university, a breadth of the university that benefits Montana kids directly uh, because of our size. Um, I think I'll stop there and go to Stephanie next. Christina? Yeah, that's great. All right. Thank you, Brad. Um, Stephanie Gray, I'm the Dean at Gallatin College, and Gallatin College is the two-year um, so a two-year degree program, one and two-year certificate program for MSU, and, and we're unique as we're, we're not a standalone community college like Flathead, for instance. We are, um, you know, I'm a dean. I get to go to the same meetings that Dean Dunny goes to, and I'm a part. Of, we're a part of MSU, which has a lot of great assets that we will um, talk about later in the conversation. So, um, in regards to Gallatin College. We are, um, we have four major programs. One of them is developmental education um, that help, help with the engineering students that, that get to come to MSU. Uh, we help get those students into college um, level math. And usually we have about 1,100 to 1,200 uh, students studying math, getting ready to get, get over into engineering. And a lot of people don't know that we provide that service, but um, we have small classes. We are we highly value that every student can learn math, and every student that comes to MSU can become an engineer, just like the dean to my left here said. And but that's a service that we provide MSU, and we won't talk much more about that today. But I wanted to mention that we also offer dual enrollment, and we're very excited about offering more career and technical education dual enrollment. Uh, programs across the state to high school students so they have a, a jump start on their uh, college college degrees or associate degrees and then um, our last program is um, workforce programs which is why we're here today so in 2012 when I started at Gallatin College I've only been the dean for I'm on my third year uh, we had nine workforce programs now we have 20 so we have been moving fast and really keeping up with the pace of the growth in our, our in our in Southwest Montana, really, and in the entire state for that matter. But obviously, we all know that Bozeman's growing at a faster pace than any other city in this state. So that's one thing I'm excited to talk more about today. In regards to our population, 73% of our students do come from Montana. And of those 73%, 52% of them do live here in Bozeman already. 15% um, of them come from the surrounding areas, um, Manhattan, Three Forks, those areas, West Yellowstone, all those areas. And then I think it's interesting to know that 21% of them actually come from across the state. We have representation from 57 different little towns across the state. So uh, students like to come and have a college experience, even if they're only getting a welding certificate, right? They get to come here, they can live in the dorms, and they can work on their welding certificate or whatever else of those 20 that we offer, and then return home to provide those services in their communities. 64% uh, of our students are part-time, so it is going to take them longer, but they're doing that for a very important reason, because they want to work, and they want to help pay for their education. And let's see what else. We offer everything from a nine credit phlebotomy degree to a two year photonics, optics, and lasers uh, degree. So uh, we'll talk more about the specific degrees and the, and the higher tech uh, certificates that we offer. Um, you know, one thing about Gallatin College is we try to be a reflection of our community and of our state. And in my head, what that means is we have to keep the pace moving. And I already talked about um, you know, how quickly we've grown. Our numbers and our enrollment continue to grow. We're probably, I mean, we're one of the very few community colleges across the country that maintained enrollment or grew enrollment. And we're very uh, happy about that. And that's really because our students wanted to keep working and wanted to keep moving forward um, during these past three years. Let's see. I think that's it. Next to the comparing the last question I asked, you asked. Um, yeah, just been just keeping up with a really fast pace we have here. And and I just want to challenge the notion that higher education does not adapt. 
you know, I think that we've demonstrated that we can adapt quickly. And I'm going to talk about an avionics program that has only taken us one year to get up and rolling. And that's certainly because of a very strong partner in Bridger Aeronautics. But um, I, I think we are learning every day and, and, and COVID has helped us learn how to be more adaptable and deliver education in a variety of different ways um, that meet our students and our industry needs. All right. Well, thank you, Stephanie. My name is John Paxton. I'm the director of the Jean Forte School of Computing. Um, a little bit about myself. I grew up in Ohio. I went to Ohio State University for undergrad, where maybe not surprisingly, I majored in computer science. Maybe more surprisingly, I minored in German. And then I went to um, a school I never thought I would go to growing up in Ohio. I went to the University of Michigan for my uh, both my master's and PhD, the big rival. And um, after finishing up there, um, I moved out to, uh, to Bozeman and took a job here at Montana State back in 1990. So this is year 32 for me. Bozeman has changed radically. So has the university. 32 is a good computer science number. It's two raised to the fifth power. Um, in any case, since the fall of 2007, I have been uh, privileged to serve first as the, uh, the department head of the computer science department. And then back in 2016, we uh, made the argument that in today's world, um, computing connects to everything. We need to um, sort of be a little bit think more expansively. We became a school of computing. We received a very generous naming gift. Um, so we're now the Gianforte School of Computing. And um, in the last five or six years since becoming a school of computing, we have partnered with um, lots of academic units around campus to roll out a much broader set of degrees. So for example, um, we now offer a Bachelor of Arts degree for students who have strong interests in non-STEM areas can get a concentration, say like in sociology, they can still learn some about computer science, and then they're very marketable for a career with say a social media company like uh, Facebook. So the idea would be from a sociology standpoint, they, they better understand um, what types of uh, questions to ask about the data. But from a computer science standpoint, they know technically what, what is possible. Um, I'll be talking about many of the other initiatives uh, later on um, during this panel session. But um, thank you all for coming. All right. Uh, next question is about uh, bright spots and exciting programs. So some of you are already talking at the bed, I can tell, to talk about some of these programs that you love, but please tell us what are some of the successful programs and new initiatives you offer that are supporting technology education in Montana and give us the details. Why don't we start with John this time? All right, thank you, Christina. So um, in recent years, um, we have been working on data science initiatives so uh, about four years ago, in partnership with the Department of Mathematical Sciences, we rolled out a master's degree in data science. Um, three years ago, again in partnership, um, we rolled out a minor. And this year, we're actually working on a data science bachelor's degree proposal. Um, the request to plan goes before the Board of Regents meeting in just over a week, if that's approved. We'll then get the proposal into the system. With any luck, um, that will be available sometime next academic year. And uh, based on the interest in the data science minor, which has been attracting about 20 students per year, I would estimate that maybe we're going to get about 50 students per year pursuing the, uh, the data science bachelor's degree. So at steady state, maybe it's serving 200 students. And in today's world where everything from your smartphones to your columbines are generating lots and lots of sort of like, like data, sort of like putting that all together and trying to make sense of it has all sorts of um, applications in health, in a transportation and urban um, uh, planning and so on and so forth. Um, so if we look at our organization currently, we serve about 500 students with undergraduate bachelor's degrees. Um, we serve about 50 students with either master's or PhDs. We serve about 100 students with uh, various minors, the data science minor, the computer science minor. We also, um, in partnership with education, we offer a teaching minor. And um, just last March, we uh, rolled out or had approved by the Board of Regents a master's in cybersecurity. There's also a big need in um, kind of companies around the states and around the nation for more people with cybersecurity expertise. Um, 
This year, we've already hired two people in our faculty search who can help contribute to that program. So it's looking like next um, kind of fall, that, that program should be off the ground. And so from a computer science standpoint, you know, some of the big areas in today's world, data science, which includes things like business analytics, um, that's a big area. Anything that's kind of security, cybersecurity related, um, important across everything. So even for food, um, cybersecurity turns out to be very important. And then um, sort of the whole kind of artificial intelligence, machine learning realm, where you somehow use learning techniques to make your software like better over time. There's more and more interest and demand for people with, with um, those uh, skills as well. And, you know, just um, looking at recent graduates. So um, I looked at people who graduated uh, three years ago, um, 80 or so bachelor students. And um, as Brett had mentioned earlier, about half of the students in the College of Engineering are in-state, half are out of state. And so I was curious to look into their LinkedIn profiles to kind of get a sense for like, where do these people go? And what I found very interesting was about half of our in-state people are working in Montana, about half left Montana, but about half of the out-of-state people are now working in Montana. The other half went out of state. So these out-of-state students are definitely contributing to the in-state workforce. And then for many of the Montana students, I've had many of these conversations in, in, um, over the years, but um, there will be a student, say, from Ikalaka or Tudot or Fairfield. And um, when they're a college student, it's like, okay, Professor Paxton, the one thing I know for sure is I grew up in a small town. I need to see the world. I want to go to Seattle, Denver. And, and they do when they graduate. And then about five or 10 years later, I get an email from the same person or a phone call. And it's like, um, I've seen the world. How do I get back to Montana? And so many of these people do come back and sort of feed the, uh, the high tech industry. Um, so with that, I could talk more, but I've talked enough. I'll pass things over to Stephanie. Go ahead. Well, you're going to hear some themes today. So well done. Um, one of our uh, programs that is seeing success, no surprise, is our IT networking and cybersecurity program. And uh, before you ask, whenever Gallatin College designs any of these uh, one and two year programs, we go have a conversation with John, or we go have a conversation with the department head at MSU to make sure we're designing it in a way that if a student eventually is going to transfer to one of your programs, they at least have taken the proper math and the correct reading and or writing, and um, so, so they can transfer easily into a four-year degree. Uh, since our programs are more technical and applied in practice, uh, some of those classes may not transfer, but they're certainly going to make the student much more um, marketable when they go out if they have a four-year degree and they have the uh, networking certificate from us. I, I hope you would agree. <laughs> um, so our one-year certificate in IT networking prepares students to go out and set up your office, um, to, to put it simply. And then the cyber cybersecurity certificate that's attached to that um, helps them prepare professionals who are already out in the community. They can come back and take this um, to keep your offices safe and protected. Um, to some of those threats. This is the third year we've run this program, and it generally takes about three years to get full enrollment if you're working hard on the marketing and recruiting. We've like had full enrollment in these programs, and now some of the students are saying, you know what, I want a little more. I want to be the manager, or I want to be the person in charge of the hospital who's running the, um, you know, the IT uh, department. And so we're going to be offering, starting next fall, a two-year IT networking um, Associate of Applied Science and a two-year cybersecurity Associate of Applied Science. So we're very excited about that one. And then the other thing um, we are, I think is a gem, is our CNC machining program, Computer Numerical Controlled Machining. And you, you need to think about machining now in a whole new way. It, it literally is controlled by computers. Our students spend half of their time, 50% of their time on a software product that is communicating to the machine to tell it what to be producing and um, making. And um, that program has been full since kind of its three-year mark. I think we're in year five right now and very popular. And if you go into that shop or into our lab, you'll see a list of probably 30 businesses that need our students right now. 
and it ranges from um, people making guns to bows to skis, all kinds of really great products that are sold across the world. And one thing that that director is getting ready to, to look at, which goes back to what some of you are in the room for, is robotics. And um, how can we uh, um, automate machining and how uh, can we use robots to make the processing more quick and our local industry, they're, they're, you know, they're just starting to tip their toe into that water. And so we need to be ready and prepared. And so we're looking at a robotics tending and a robotics um, implementing program. So it's one thing to just buy this thing and put it in your shop. You have to know how to code it and tell it what to do and, and to take care of it. So it can work 24 hours, seven days a week. And so that's one thing we're looking at, a really new, Thing happening in machining also is this idea of measuring the parts uh, while they're being machined. You know, right now a part you have to pull it out and measure it to make sure it's the right part. You want everything to be the right size so it can fit into the car or you know whatever it needs to be fitting into. And uh, right now that's that's not automated. So our director um, is is keeping an eye on machines that are eventually going to be able to in real time measure the part and self-correct for that um, accuracy, and it will also speed up processing. And um, so we're very excited, you know, how we can integrate that into our curriculum so students can learn the latest things in technology in regards to machining. And then the last thing, well, the last thing I'll talk about is our, uh, that I mentioned was avionics, avionic electronics technology. This was a great, um, program because Bridger Aer Aeronautics came to us and said we need we're going to need more avionics technicians and we really need that specialty we, they don't need to know anything else and we want to help support that and um, you know to start a program is expensive you you have to build the curriculum which takes technical expertise. You have to find the space, you have to find the equipment, you have, you know, it takes, it takes starting a business and you're starting from scratch. And so for a private sector partner to say we want to help pay for that and support that, and since we don't have the space to run it right now because of our facility limitations, they said, well, why don't you run your labs in our, in our space? And so we're going to be teaching um, some of the labs out at the airport, and we're um, going to be doing some of the work here, which is a challenge for our students. They're going to need to be able to go back and forth, but we're going to make that happen. That's going to start in the fall, and it's just it's just an exciting. Not only is it an ex, is it an exciting program because then we're going to build off of that. Probably technicians around automated vehicles or autonomous vehicles, whether they're air flight or vehicles that drive because it's some of the same technology in electronics, some of the same technology we learn in photonics, so we can combine those and be prepared for that, that next stage of electronic vehicles and fixing those um, for autonomous and electronic vehicles. So it kind of all can go together if you design the program right. So that's one thing I'm really looking forward to is getting into that world. Uh, the other challenge for us when we do these new things is finding the experts and the faculty to teach these things that haven't even been, uh, the occupations haven't even been described yet. And so we, we're guessing at what we think we should be teaching. Um, a new occupation is called service engineering operator, and that's somebody who can work on electric cars and autonomous uh, vehicles also. They need to know uh, either a little about a lot or um, the engineers maybe know a lot about very specific parts of those things. Um, so it's a great new challenge, and that I'll head it off to you. Well, really quick before, um, two quick questions for me. How long are those programs in machining and avion? Um, the machine program is a, it's a nine month, the one year program, and then the avionics is going to be two years. And my second question, <laughs> um, uh, I forgot. Never mind. Go ahead, Brett. I'm going to skip this a little bit. Uh, different direction. Um, I think 
going to the question, I'm not quite a politician. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll do the efforts of the politician. Um, so we talked a little bit about being bigger, uh, but in my mind, uh, bigger is fine, but bigger also presents opportunities to be better. And if you don't take advantage of those opportunities to become bigger and better, then you're not doing your job well. Uh, and so I mentioned the fact that we've gotten a lot larger in terms of undergraduate enrollment from 2,000 to about 3,800 students enrolled in the program. And so that provides, it has provided us, and continues to provide us an opportunity to get better. Because if you have more students, obviously you need more faculty. So if I walk into President Cruzado's office and say, I got a thousand more students, I need some more faculty, she's likely to say that, right? And so faculty in College of Engineering uh, have multiple roles. They have to deliver or participate in the team that delivers high quality undergraduate education. And I think we do a, a good job of that. But they're also engaged in graduate education and research. So with that growth, we've been able to greatly expand uh, our doctoral uh, programs. We've been able to uh, more than double the dollar amount of uh, research grant and contract uh, that we do. Uh, and we've been able to do some other things with respect to how we look as a college uh, in that world. Uh, so <clears throat> If we were taking a picture of the college uh, 10 years ago, if we could put John and I in it, and, and, and that's it, everybody looked like John and I. Now we can let Stephanie uh, slide in, and I have a lot of faculty that look like Stephanie. Uh, so we have 25% uh, women faculty in the College of Engineering, now actually a little bit more than that. Our female enrollments have followed that. We have over 20% uh, female enrollments, and we've got Record enrollments of other underrepresented groups uh, historically in um, engineering education. Uh, and I think that's important. I, that becomes very important to me when I reflect back to, back to what we're here for the land grant university, which is to educate the sons and daughters of the working class of America. And I take that very literally, all of us. Right, so all of the sons and all of the daughters inspired to be the have that opportunity. The other thing that, that growth has done in growth of uh, uh, research is it's allowed us to have a bigger presence in the academic development arena. Uh, and a lot of the uh, companies, the high tech companies that are in the valley, have a close relationship with um, Nevada State University and the College of Engineering and the physics department and the work they're doing that spun off from uh, 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 research at the university a generation ago. And we have a much bigger capacity to do that now. Uh, and a bigger capacity to engage uh, industry in Montana, right? So one of the things that can attract high tech industry to the state of Montana is the opportunity to partner with universities and partner with colleges of engineering. They're interested in that because they need workforce, uh, but they're interested in that because they need to be at the leading edge of technologies that are coming out. We've developed some very developed and or have expanded on very healthy partnerships with companies like Boeing. If many are familiar with that. We've got a Boeing facility in Helena. Uh, um, we Raytheon Corporation and smaller units, we, we're, we're having a uh, development opportunity with a unit from Hyundai that's coming to town. All of that um, expertise and knowledge and strength of the college is attractive to those companies that might potentially think about not only coming in and hiring graduates, but maybe leading something here, right? opening an office and that sort of thing. So I think that's a, a very important part of that. Um, Let's see if I want to add anything else to that. Um, I, I think I'll continue with this one. All right, next question for the panel, and I'll leave this up to whomever would like to answer first. What are our gaps and opportunities in Montana? So in your opinion, what are some of the biggest opportunities we have 
uh, to fill needs and improve technology education for upcoming generations. Go ahead. All right, I, I'll start. I think one big opportunity we have is the 40% of Montana high school students that aren't accessing any higher education. We have got to get to those students and their parents and their counselors and tell them, come to MSU, you can get a one-year certificate, you can get a PhD, you, you know, anything you need is here. And um, I, I think we need to explain technology to them. I think when we go into high school classrooms and talk about photonics, a lot of them look at us like, I have, what do you, what's the value for me in this and what is it? And oh, I didn't know there's 40 companies in Bozeman that Brett just, you know, that's the story Brett just told. And I can actually get a job there as a tech or engineer. Um, and so, we need to, that's a huge opportunity, and we need to do a better job of telling that, of getting their interest. And we do that at the university, and um, that there's so many new different types of occupations that they can join in Montana to be a part of the economy here. So, yeah, I'll start with the high schools or the K through 12 system as well. So, um, what one of the things that I've noticed um, in talking to them, especially some of the, uh, the teachers and school systems with, that are more rurally based, there are not a lot of good opportunities for students to, to really learn what is computer science, for example, and to be motivated by it. So 15 years ago, we had we served maybe about a third of the number of students that we currently do, so maybe just right around 200. And we embarked on an initiative at the time to um, hire someone to, uh, to, to basically serve as our outreach coordinator. And she worked with one of my colleagues and we started visiting schools all around the state, not only the big schools, but many smaller schools as well. Um, my colleague, Hunter Lloyd, um, before he got his master's in computer science was a professional comedian. He actually opened once for Jerry Seinfeld down in um, Vegas. So he, he would go around the state with this robot comedy show and give it to the various auditoriums. And this really um, sort of raised interest. And, and what it showed me was like, like, you know, when people were coming to the university, in many cases, they were not even thinking about like a high tech major such as computer science, because their exposure had been like, oh, computer science is using Microsoft Word, it's using Excel, it's using the web. And so of course that's not very appealing as something that you would do for your whole career. Um, they didn't really understand the potential about what it really involves um, and the problem solving, the excitement, the ability to um, to improve the world in which we live. And so um, so so part of that is um, after having had that experience, we've developed um, two dual enrollment courses along with teacher training. So kind of hand in hand with this K through 12 kind of issue, if you will, Part of it is that the many of the current teachers who are teaching in the system, they also don't have this technology background. And so they are not in a position to really offer these courses in a manner that's compelling to the students. And so I think, you know, like, like somehow, if, you know, in every state controls its own education system that, <clears throat> and this comes in biased from the director of the School of Computing, but I would love to see computer science be a required component of a K through 12 education, just like, you know, there's so much English that's required and history and writing. Um, I think this would then guarantee that schools would need to go out and hire at least one teacher that had the appropriate background and was certified in this area. So we currently, you know, partner with education to offer a computer science um, teaching minor. But in fact, when that's not an actively sought credential in the state of Montana, not a lot of people are going to, um, to earn it. So, so, so I, I just see a huge opportunity there that if we could get more compelling technology education into the K through 12 system, um, we would be in a much better place um, going forward. And then the other thing kind of moving up to the university level. So at least in the 32 years I've been in Montana, I kind of characterize like all things supported by Montana is surprisingly good, but they run in a surprisingly underfunded manner. Um, compared to, um, say, other states like, like the Michigan education system that I saw. 
And so one of the things that happened back in 2000 was like the state of Utah, they made statewide with kind of a state partnership with industry, partnering with higher education, they made a targeted investment in basically technology and computer science education. And 22 years later, that has paid off with, you know, billions of dollars of economic development in the state of Utah. They've really um, increased the number of students that are earning the high-tech degrees. And so I see at least potential for something like that maybe happening in Montana someday. And that could really benefit the, uh, the state with a lot of um, kind of high-tech development and uh, growth opportunities. So those are the two big areas that I currently see. I'll pass things to Brad. So I think a gap and an opportunity are the same thing. Uh, you identify a gap and you turn it into an opportunity. And but when I think about um, the answer to the question, John, is it in that same direction? I felt a, 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 a couple of stories. Uh, I'll tell you quick. I'm not very good at quick. Um, the, the gentleman who built this building for us, Norm at Lawrence. Uh, Norm, uh, as those of you are familiar with his uh, story, he grew up in the 50s in Winterford, Montana, that thriving metropolitan area right in the center of the state that still is home to about 180 people today. He went to Montana State College, he spent some time in the military, he had kind of a corporate career, and he built a company called Aon. Uh, and they make heating, ventilating, and air conditioning equipment in Tulsa, Oklahoma, primarily. Uh, I'd like to describe that uh, Norm as a person who didn't know he couldn't do what he did. Uh, nobody makes commodity air conditioning equipment in the United States. Except Norm has joined it. And he makes a lot of money doing it. And I'd like to spend on any very generous one. Uh, so that's one story. Uh, another quick one, and uh, uh, this is your maybe less familiar with his name is Wes Crum Crane. Uh, he grew up in a lot bigger place, Gardner, Montana, uh, and uh, went to school at North Montana State University then. Uh, and he was uh, in the Air Force ROTC cadet, uh, cadre, uh, fighter planes for our country for a while, and now he's the president of the Young Missiles and Defense. Tucson, Arizona, and he signed $2 billion contracts for the Saudis <laughs> as he was going there. So I, 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 I bring those two to light. Um, uh, uh, Norm is older than me, less than a little bit younger than me, but not much. And I worry and wonder if those same paths are available for the kids from rural Montana today. Is there is there, is there uh, Norm at Jordan and Roundup right now? Uh, and I get concerned because um, um, the opportunities in uh, those schools to get the level of education that it needs to compete at the university level, um, uh, maybe not what they should be. Uh, Spanish programs can help fill some of that gap. Uh, some of you may know Norm is building a school, literally building a school in Winifred, Montana. He hopes to become a model for rural education in Montana so that uh, every kid in rural Montana that has is capable and ready to take a calculus course for the critical for engineering has access to it. Uh, and then I also worry about are they going to have the financial resources? Uh, it's harder. I, 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 my, my, my father was a sergeant in the U.S. Army, so he didn't write me a very good check when I left home. But it was a different environment then. I, I, I was able to work. I got some Pell Grants. I graduated without a lot debt. It's a lot harder for our kids today. And I think we need to think about the gap for that student in rural Montana, first in terms of access to education, and particularly technological education, uh, and uh, their ability to uh, uh, excel and realize the American dream like a lot of them uh, see in MSU um, um, graduates have. One program on the good piece that we have here that I think is very important that, that I would like to continue to build on with college engineering support is the Lego Robotics Program. 
<laughs> they reached out into our junior highs and our high schools in a very important way in helping those students realize, hey, I mean, oh, this is fun. And maybe I can be an electrical engineer, or computer engineer, or whatever they aspire to do. And it's interesting when they come for the state competition here in Bozeman, right? It's it's actually harder to get the Bozeman High kids interested in doing something like that than it is the kids from Jordan, right? Because their suite of activities that they have available for them in Bozeman is quite a bit different than the suite of activities that are available in Jordan. So that's a very important program for us is that the Lego robotics program. I'd like to expand that a lot more, but we're right at the point where we've got to have to have qualifiers for state uh, because uh, that level of participation is going up. Um, I, I think uh, being able to um, think about students in Montana uh, uh, that need a hand up uh, to, to be all that they could be, I, I think that's an important gap that we need to continue to work on. That's a perfect setup for the first robotics folks that we have represented um, today in the meeting. Before we transition into the discussion, uh, bringing in other folks in the room, I just wanted to open it up if anybody has particular questions that you would like to ask of our three panelists. Yeah, and if you want to go ahead and um, shout it out, or Beth maybe has the mic to be it. Thank you. Um, I do have. I have a couple of questions. They're kind of one of them is just to make sure I understand what you said. Um, and that question is for Stephanie. You said forty percent of Montana students are not going to. Um, any type of higher ed. I, I want to clarify if you are talking about kids who are going to the trades that are getting higher education or continuing education, but just not at the school. I guess. I mean, if you're going to become a plumber's apprentice, you're not going to college. That's my question. No, my understanding is it is from the commissioner's office, it's just those students that we can track from high school into. It, it does include two here or our one of our four year partners. So not it wouldn't include the trades or you know apprenticeship programs. I, I just wanted to um the military or yeah, I, I don't know how to call it is appropriate. I just wanted to say that I don't want to leave those kids out. I have one. I I have all all the gamut of military, college, and non-college track trades. Children in my own family, and I hate to say that. Well, the one is not included, and therefore we have to go find him. But he's not. It's not appropriate. It's part of our education requirement in Montana. It has to be appropriate education and for some students. I think it's really important not to diminish education in any way. I mean, one of my sons teaches at the school, so um, it's important, but. We need to not marginalize the kids who are not going on and they're taking a different path. So that would be my one clarification. And then I have a question if, um, if I can for Brett. Um, yeah, I really like what you said about the rural kids because I'm a represent rural district and I'm from a much more rural district right outside of Winifred. Um, so do you see distance learning? As a solution that we should be looking at more, meaning um, some of these schools don't have a teacher, like you said, um, for higher math or computer science, but we do have now a lot more experience with distance learning. And so I wonder if we're looking at that as a viable solution for that problem. Thank you. Yeah, your description, my knowledge of uh, secondary education, yeah, so this is an opinion. <laughs> but it's Brent's opinion, not being that kind of opinion. Uh, yeah, I think it comes into a place, and I want to put a big caveat on that. We have to be very smart about how we do that. Because one of the things I think we learned in this COVID is that. Having our kids at home learning from your basement or in a second bedroom doesn't work very well. So 
I think there are opportunities for distance education into uh, the subject area, I'll say on calculus, uh, that would benefit kids in rural areas. But we have to be very careful about how we deliver that education and make sure they are supported with face to face interactions where they're at. So we have to do it very well. Uh, but um, that's part of what uh, I think Norm is working on. Uh, at, uh, are helping the Winifred people work on is, is how can we make, um, you know, so there may be some schools where you only have somebody that wants to take calculus once every three years. So you can't have a, a teacher to come in and teach one student once every three years. There has to be another solution to that. And that could well be distance education as long as that student has other face-to-face -face support and, and social interactions and all of that stuff that go on with being a, a teenager. Thank you. And this builds a little bit on Jennifer's, I guess, with the ag thing. In Montana, and in this, I think maybe John, you talked about the data science program, and that intrigues me, right? Because one, transitioning our farm to the next generation, we need to find ways, right, to bring that generation to be mom and dad's right, retirement. Somehow, the ag sector has to be able to find new ways of doing that without burdening our kids to supply that. So this data science program seems, like, like you say, I sit my tractor, I use our GPS, there's just oodles of data happens, right, that I'm not aware of, but the kids are. So what hurdles, and I mean, it, it's great that you're seeing this as an opportunity, and I look at it as a chance to, uh, so speaking right now about technology, my earballs with my new hearing aids is picking up the doggone telephone ringing in my ears, and now I've got that going on, but you don't even know, I'm still trying to focus on my question. So technology can be great. But getting back to our kids in Montana, what what gaps are we, or what opportunities do we need as a state to provide that ability to these rural kids to take that data and apply it in irrigation, cattle records, field crops, you know, all all that we're starting to see. So what are we missing as a state that we can help provide our when we're ready to put those kids to work? Yeah, so very good question. So, you know, the way we're structuring the data science degree, we're intentionally leaving. So, like, it's very common at a university to um, totally structure a degree to be 120 credits, and you sort of dot the I's and cross the T's, and there's not a lot of choice for students. So, we're going to leave um, maybe about a sixth of the degree as free electives with the idea that a student can then pick an application area where they want to apply their data science knowledge. So one of the areas would be agriculture, precision agriculture. I actually have a colleague, he's um, retired from the USGS. And one of the things he is currently doing is he's working with farmers around the state to collect data on their fields and the topography and the habitat with the idea of identifying low producing areas of the fields that then provide great pheasant habitat. This so my retired colleague wants to bird hunt, and so he's highly motivated <laughs> on this this project to preserve good 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 hunting bird habitat. But you know, um, when you have the data there, everything from like being able to uh, vary the types of um, you know moisture that you're putting on different parts of the field. So 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 higher parts might need more watering than like lower parts. Um, fertilizer differences based on sunlight, the shade. There's so much that if you've got the data. And if you have it from enough different um, kind of like, like areas around the state, you can make more informed decisions to maybe um, use less chemicals and um, you know have, have better produce and so on and so forth. And so I, I think, you know, again, going back to this, this outreach experience that we've had, a lot of it is just um, making sure that students, while they're in the K through 12 system, they have exciting, compelling exposure to high tech so that if they do choose to go to um you know next steps to college to um to a community college 
um, that this is on the radar of something that they might want to study. So, so part of our outreach and what that showed me was um, when we went from like serving 200 students to now 600, a lot of the students, um, computer science was just off the radar. They just did not know that that could be an exciting career. And I think with data science, it's a similar thing. We need to make sure that there are, is education in the K through 12 system that reaches these students with these opportunities. I'd like to add to that a little bit, Paul. Um, so you're living technology and agriculture. Obviously, the last tractor I drove was about 40 years ago, and it was a farm all age. I don't think I can drive a little tractor now. Um, and I wish to really treat a lot of lives of being in agriculture. I'd like to hear her answer that question. I do know of some of the interdisciplinary activity that's going on across the university and connecting faculty in agriculture whose expertise is precision in agriculture, which includes uh, Dr. Bajwa herself, data scientist in, in uh, John's College and um, optics, photonics, LIDAR um, uh, engineers in my college are, are going to provide, are going to continue us on that. Uh, there's a downside to that because it changes the skill set and it changes the number of people. Uh, but I, I don't think we can, we're going to be able to change that path. But we can be leaders in, in that if we and we want to. Be. And, and thanks for that. And I would agree with on that downside, but no matter what, that side is coming. Yeah. So being proactive and, and addressing it is only going to help right our next generations. And then, if I could, um, for Stephanie, just a, a quick question. It, it seems that Bridger um, sort of set the bar, right? At, at, at coming to you with a question or, or a need, and how do you make that fit? Um, do you see? It's awesome. I think that as industry changes, they see that need and then they can come to you. So, do you see this? To what other, I guess, industries do you see possible that, that the same type of format could happen? Knowing the hurdles, right, of what you just said, the space, the folks, and that type of thing. Well, I think of healthcare, you know, I actually think of cooperative style of all the healthcare firms that get together and tell you that we need um, what, whatever that might be. We need uh, more phlebotomists or more um, medical lab techs and um, they could support that. Um, then any kind of manufacturing, uh, you know, robotics, all the manufacturers are going to start to dabble in this a little bit and it would be nice if they just had people they could hire to come help them implement um, a, a robot on the floor so I you know I could see something like that coming together I'm, I'm you know because we're in Montana and there's a lot of small businesses Bridger was unique because they happened to have probably an influx of capital and they were they were very strategic and where they were heading next um, but you know, any uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of IT applications. Tell them about your construction trades program. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's <laughs> construction trades. Is a, thank you. Is a, and a, we're we're starting our first carpentry program, but you could definitely see an opportunity there, right? Uh, of, of all the companies across the state, funding programs that were well aligned. I mean, we're already aligned across the state at two years. We're we're offering. The construction trades and in, in similar with similar content. You know, it's there's one way of swinging a hammer and there's one way to build a wall. I, I'm sure you can argue there's not, but um, it's one of those trades that um, could be we could be doing that all over the state. So that that would be a good idea. Yeah, <laughs> what's the one with uh, oh, HVAC? Yeah, certainly. Well, whatever, I guess if you think about it, whatever it maybe is needed across the state, in every small community, we could we be offering something and doing it. What well, we could do in a virtual manner, we could do that. And then what needed to be face to face, maybe there, you know, you come together and, and offer those. Any more questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I do have some secondary background if you're interested a little bit. Go ahead. Where you want to go with that. 
Okay, so again, I'm Mike Hoffman with the Office of Public Instruction, and I work with career and technical education. I work with the quote unquote shop teachers in the state of Montana, but I also work across with business education, I work with ag education, uh, health sciences, and family and consumer sciences. So we work as a unit very effectively and very well together. Uh, and I would say uh, there's, a, there's a whole lot that, I've, that I would have to unpack with this, but I would say, Dean Young, know, one of the things that you said that was very relevant. And one of the things that we were very diligently on is trying to reach down into the middle school. So one of the things that I think I've seen happen is that this promotion of or your stop college or, or post-secondary education um, without referencing trades and uh, the technical side of things like that. Uh, first of all, we missed the boat on that because the amount of education that goes into an apprenticeship surpasses oftentimes what a master's degree is. So the, there's a tremendous amount there that's not necessarily addressed directly. Um, in our secondary schools, however, we have technical programs and we have programs that feed to your program. I would like to say that I was in Winifred. I got to see that school being built that, that uh, Norm is uh, out in the building. Fantastic school, and one of the exciting things that I found was there's a math classroom right in their ag slash industrial technology shop area. So they're going to place the math teachers right there. It's very, uh, you know, uh, to circle back around though, again, the, the reach down to the middle school level is, is absolutely going to be crucial. By the time a student gets to end of their high school career, they have often determined where they're going to go. And when they've done that, um, I'm sure you guys have seen this reflected. They don't necessarily, they think they know where they want to go. And oftentimes go through, get a degree, and then find that they need to go back and get some other degree because that career field that they pursued did not necessarily pan out. It was not what they wanted to do for fun. I feel like I'm kind of bouncing around. This is just a huge thing that I deal with on a daily basis. So uh, again, one of the other one of the other things that I've seen that I've heard is this connection to the industry. I think that's going to be one of the biggest components in determining what technology that we need and we need to train our students in to prepare them for college or whatever their post-secondary career are. Uh, one of the things too though that I didn't did, did know um, is trying to train or get our uh, post sector our secondary teachers ready to teach the computer science, for example, um, professional learning opportunities for teachers, but even more importantly is getting teachers in that secondary level. We all know that education pay is, is not that great. And relative to the amount of education we as teachers are expected to have, it's kind of abysmal, realistically. So we do run, run into that issue, especially in our small, small rural schools. The fact that we don't have the teachers that we need to teach all of those programs, it's got to be a balance. And I don't know what the answer is per se, but I just wanted to point that out. Thank you, Mike. I would like to uh, revisit first robotics. And Jack Rumpel is here in the room. Julie Heller, who's with Fusion Robotics, and Helena is also on Zoom. But Jack, if you would take a few minutes and maybe explain to those in the room who haven't had the great privilege of um, engaging with either First Lego League or, or the other levels of First, tell us what that's about. Sure. Thank you, Christina. Um, Christina knows this is difficult for me. She said I could speak for about five minutes. And when we first met, we spent about an hour talking about first robotics. Uh, this was outside in the middle of January. So I can talk a long time about this. First robotics is a um, national and it's actually a worldwide program to support and inspire kids in the K through 12 system 
using sports analogy to bring high tech into the kids' lives. Uh, there are different programs. The first Lego League that we were talking about is geared at the elementary school level. Um, it allows for some middle school uh, participation for rural, uh, low resource communities. The next level up is First Tech Challenge, and that's geared at the middle school level. And then the top tier of it, the high school level, the championship level, is first robotics competition. One well, has got a good FLL program. It's got a good FTC program. Next weekend, we're having the Montana State Championship at the First Lady League FLL here in uh, Bozeman. The following weekend, we have the FTC Championship. But in Montana, the entire state has one FRC team. That's a team out in Missoula. They're going to be competing in Idaho because there's no opportunity for them to compete here in Montana. Um, and <clears throat> Compared to, and I know we mentioned funding for Michigan, Michigan, the state of Michigan has over 600 FRC level teams. So one of my big goals is let's branch out, let's strengthen the FLL program, let's push that into the uh, elementary schools, get those kids excited about it. Let's expand the FTC program and let's really level up the FRC program across the state. Um, real quick, how many people in here, when you were in high school, you knew an engineer? And how many of those were not your relatives? We're not getting the students exposed to them. What FIRST Robotics does, it's in addition to, it's outside of the school system, it's outside of the work system, it's a bridge between them. It allows professional engineers, professional tradesmen, machinists, those kind of folks to work with the students side by side on common program. The first program has been established for 30 years. It's already there. All we have to do is pick it up and run with it. Getting an opportunity for students in across the state to work shoulder to shoulder with the, the high tech professionals that we have in our state gives them the opportunity to learn about those opportunities, to figure out about computer science and chemical engineering, machining, electronics, and those types of things. That's what the program really does. Um, so uh, there's just a ton of things that I wanted to, to carry over. Uh, we talked about expanding the first Lego robotics. We talked about getting experience in there. Um, the computer science education uh, I started with First Robotics in Colorado. I've worked with a lot of the Colorado teams, from well-established teams to rookie teams. One of the things I saw was high school students teaching elementary students to program. That's what we can do here. We've got problems in uh, training teachers and that kind of stuff. When we get the students involved in the program, they will get the skills, they will figure it out. And it's all built on a sports competition model. The students are excited about building robots because they're going to take their robot to compete with teams from across the state and uh, around the world um, on that. So there, there's a great opportunity and a great connection between what we've got going and what First, off, First Robotics uh, offers. Uh, right now, uh, so I recently retired as an engineer at Lockheed Martin. And part of my decision to retire was, one, I wanted to return to Montana. And two, I wanted to spend my time focusing and growing the FIRST program. The things that I've seen those students do is amazing. Um, in Colorado, Lockheed Martin opened high school level internships. We had a high school student on a FIRST robotics team writing the software for NASA's Lucy mission, which is now on its way to Jupiter to study asteroids. There is code written by high school students on that. We had a, a student working with a Lockheed Martin engineers learn how to examine the X-ray imagery after you put an ablative shield on a spacecraft. She did the, uh, the final test report for the Perseverance lander to ensure that the heat shield going through the Mars atmosphere was going to work. And I've got a dozen other of those stories. These are things that we're seeing the high school students do. So for the business folks here, uh, I want to encourage you to open up those high school internships. Let's talk. 
Let's talk about getting a first program in your community so we can start inspiring them to do it. Everybody here from the university knows you don't have someone show up as a high school graduate, look over the class report, the class listing, and go, you know what? Today's the day I think I'm going to try out that engineering thing. It's going to take that inspiration from a very young age and an opportunity to be exposed to that. Um, as I look at the first program here in the state, I set forth for uh, the first group three short term goals, three things I want to do within the next three years. One is to work with the legislature to get a state grant similar to the one in Michigan, the one in Illinois, the one in Hawaii, the one in uh, Washington State, where any organization that wants to start a first robotics team, the state pays the registration. That's not their full budget. They're still going to have to do uh, fundraising and manage budgets and schedules and those kind of things. But let's give them a leg up so that they can get their registration for the year paid for. The next thing I want to do, I want to host an FRC regional here in the state of Montana. All those students that are working really hard in Missoula to build their robot on a six week deadline uh, to compete, they have to go to Idaho or Washington or Canada or Utah in order to compete. Let's bring that home. Let's let them compete here in the state and let's make an opportunity for those students in those neighboring states to come and compete against our teams as well. And the, the third pro, the third goal that I have, I really want to open up the high tech high school internships. What I've seen these students do from CAD work, from CNC work, from machining, electronics, electrical work, software coding, all of it, we can put to work right here in the state and bridge those connections, allow them to work with your professionals here in the state and give them an idea that right here, they can have a high tech career. They can do these um, top level, high paying jobs and grow our economy. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. And Jack also brought one of the FTC robots, and so you can see a demo on the break later. One of my favorite stories is I've been traveling around the state. I've been connecting with a lot of first robotics folks like Julie um, and Helena. There's a team at Eureka. But the Sun River robotics team, they have dubbed themselves the Redneck Robotics Team in Sun River, Montana. They have gone to nationals, I believe, three times. They wear tie-dye shirts and bib overalls, and they also raise funds by 3D printing soybean sorters and selling them to local farmers. So I think this is a program that it can reach our urban centers, it can reach rural communities, and provide access to these incredible uh, work-based learning skills for our students. So thank you so much, Jack. I also wanted to give Marianne Smith with Code Girls United a few minutes to talk about her program. Yeah, our program um, is is reaching out to fourth to eighth grade girls in Montana, and we focus on them because, again, like going back to what uh, the fellow from OPI is talking about, uh, based on some studies from Accenture and University of Women, 68% of girls that participate in an after school coding program or learning situation, they go on to take courses in high school or college. And what we were seeing, and especially, you know, anecdotally what I was seeing, because I did adjunct at, um, at Flathead Valley for a little while, is that there were very few women, very few girls in the dual enrollment program coming into those first, uh, first classes. So uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to reach that age group in particular so that they'll move ahead and provide a pipeline either into college or into uh, two-year programs or certificate programs, what, whatever they're, they're going to end up doing. But we do this with a year-round program. We start uh, teaching computer science after school and we focus on just computer science concepts and having them work with some block coding. And then we, we have them create a little, uh, a software team, basically a software company, and we, we run them through the business process of creating a product. And then we have a competition where they can win uh, pretty decent scholarship prizes. So, so that's what our program is, but we are reaching out to, and not 
frankly, to Bozeman because there isn't a lot of interest. We're reaching out to smaller rural communities like Chinook and Haver and Sydney. Um, and we've also just got a state grant for a tribal coding program um, that we're gonna be rolling out in Browning. So we're really trying to reach people at an age where we can get them moving so that before they hit high school, again, before they're hitting high school, they're getting some interest. And for girls in particular, this may not be politically correct, but uh, what we found is they like to work on problems that are close to them. Um, it's not so much a, a sports situation. It's more like uh, there's a lot of animals. I wanna save endangered animals. I want to um, clean up garbage. I wanna solve bullying. Uh, so, so taking on things that they are passionate about and creating a product for it. So in general, what we're doing is we're taking the whole situation where they're just using technology and putting them in a position where they can create similar to FIRST Robotics. You're creating something, doing something instead of just using technology. And going back to the, the whole thing with the schools, I can tell you from all of my interactions all over the state to mostly you know rural and some of the cities, it is, there's a big gap with teachers, not only ability to teach some of these topics, but also their fear of it. You know, they don't understand it. They know how to use their phone. They really don't know what's going on in the background. It's scary. Computer science is scary uh, to those folks. So it's hard for them. Uh, it's hard for them to teach it without having either a background in it. And again, if you put everybody through a program where they really understood it, they probably all go get jobs as developers and, and maybe, maybe lead teaching. So, um, so I think that there are some, some issues. There is not a state mandate for computer science. They have been working on it for years um, and they've got some rough drafts of some things right now, but you know, most of the teachers, they, they do their own curriculum. So a lot of them rely on something called code.org, but they're putting together things where, where they're just throwing stuff together because they really don't know what to do. And I can give you one example. We have an advanced program where it's, I hate to say it's equivalent of a college class, but it's sort of equivalent <laughs> where what we ended up doing is we create, we created the curriculum for everything that we do. So what we did was we offered it to uh, the Browning High School teacher, who's a fabulous teacher, really wonderful guy. Um, and he took the curriculum. The problem was is that his students were not able to use that curriculum because they never had any training at all. So they were working at a level where our girls are working at maybe fifth or sixth grade that are in our program anyway. So. So there's this real disconnect where kids are not getting that education early enough. And frankly, I know it's Montana, but that's what the kids in all of these other states, like you talk about Michigan or California or, or Washington in these big urban areas, the kids are getting this when they're in the elementary ages. They're not getting it at in high school. So I think that, you know, doing whatever we can to to push um, to get more technology education and comfort with it. And also, um, I know you talked about uh, the first robotics to talk about mentors. That's another thing that we do is we provide women mentors uh, from back in the, when I was like, I, I think I was the 0.1% in the engineering department <laughs> at the time, but providing, um, providing women that they can see. And sometimes we can't do that in person. We deliver programs online which it's harder, I have to tell you, it's a lot harder, but it can be done. And we've been doing it for the last two years and, and, and it's actually doing really well. So there's a lot of opportunity. Thank you so much. I wanted to carve out five minutes too. to hear from another important uh, group in the room uh, talking about veterans and how we can leverage, leverage our veteran population technology. Joe Schumacher, here in Lee Dixon. I'm wondering if you could take five minutes and tell us a bit about what you're seeing on campus and, and veterans getting into 
and I just want to recognize my colleague Nate, who's here as well. Um, he is our first successful uh, intern that's been placed through Hiring for Heroes, right? right? And so this is an opportunity for currently serving active duty members to separate from their unit a little early before the end of their contract and get a place in a local internship at a business you know, back in their community. In this case, it was Mill Tech right here on our campus. But, you know, there's a lot of federal uh, and state funding involved uh, when it comes to trying to successfully help veterans transition from the military to see gaps in agriculture um, and other high-tech industries. And the thought is we have these separating and transitioning veterans. Why not try to connect them with the opportunity? So there are great, um, sometimes when funding is an issue, there are grants that exist out there. It's just having the programs in place. And that's one thing that we're really proud of here at Montana State is uh, the Veteran Support Center that we have here on our campus that helps uh, make that transition from the military, not only back to civilian life, but higher education as well. And the point is well taken. Um, higher ed, a uh, four year degree is not for everybody. And we see that in our veteran population as well. And we work very closely with um, Dean Gray and the, and the Galaxy College, all of the programs that exist over there. Actually, just met with um, the department head for photonics and lasers. We're doing, she came to me, we're doing very specific marketing for folks leaving the Navy and the Air Force. It has these really high tech skills. I mean, they work with the highest levels, uh, you know, in the field in our government. They're coming back to Montana, where we have a very high um, per capita population, one of the highest in the nation, uh, as far as veterans uh, in our state. They have these skills and this experience, and we're not really connecting them with opportunities uh, that exist, needs that we have, but also fields uh, that will give them meaning and purpose. And help them take care of their families as well. So it's a lot, there's a lot of different moving parts. You got to have centers like mine where a little bit of, uh, you know, we do a little bit of everything um, mentoring, advising, counseling. Mostly the biggest thing that we do is help them connect with the benefits, the federal and state benefits that they have um, that allow them to go to college, uh, utilize the programming they have. But one thing that a lot of folks don't realize is um, you can benefit for internships. Um, there are plumbing you know, groups and electrician groups that have gone through the process to become VA approved uh, so veterans can utilize their education benefits for things like that. So uh, it's a great opportunity. I think that really still uh, we're just scratching the surface, uh, you know, especially here in the state of Montana. A lot of effort going into agriculture as well. well there's um, Arm to Farm, which is a really strong and upcoming program where we're trying to take uh, transitioning uh, veterans and service members and place them in opportunities. So, um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of great things going on here. We just opened a brand new center as well over in the uh, historic Romney Gymnasium. I actually recognize several of you that um, came and, and joined us in that celebration. And then just a, a great example of the investment that Montana State has made into serving those who have served. Uh, we have we serve the, the highest population of student veterans in the state of Montana, uh, right here at MSU, and we are recognized as one of the top ten most military friendly universities in the country. Um, so a lot of great opportunities here for our separating service. Thank you so much, Joe. Well, the bad news is we're about out of time, but the good news is we have a half hour break where you'll be able to network with one another and hopefully follow up on questions that you have for further discussion. Uh, we'll be reconvening at 4.30 for an employer panel. Um, so you'll get a chance to hear directly from Bridger Aerospace, which is partnering with Gallatin College for the avionics program, as well as applied materials out of Calico um, Onyx. Uh, Josh, Fitch, Josh Sizzer is here, and his team will be sharing about Onyx, um, and then Workiva as well, among other companies. So hopefully you can uh, stay and join us for that. We'll also have a reception to follow immediately after at 5.30. Uh, right here in this room, it's all happening here. So feel free to, to take a break, talk among uh, yourselves, and we'll get regrouped and, and reconvened at 
4.30 for the employment panel. And our MSU students will be joining us. They've been signing up in droves over the last few days to learn about how to get Montana jobs and internships. So I think we'll have at least probably 50 or 60 students joining us, both in person and in Zoom. So we'll get a chance to talk to the young people who are enrolled here um, across campus. So thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you again in a little bit.